Good day and uh, welcome to Glasnost in our time where we try to look at the world rationally in the hope that it will look rationally back. I'm your host, Anthony D'Agostino. It's January 17th, 2023. The Biden administration continues to dig in its heels in support of Ukraine and the Donbass. Russia has taken Bakhmut and uh, the Russians are in, under the impression that it means a breakthrough in the struggle for the Donbass. Ukraine says it can still win if it gets a new tank army from NATO. Ukraine is actually planning a spring offensive at the, at the moment. Uh, NATO seems uh, uh, to be sending some of the requested tanks uh, and the Ukrainians think that NATO has crossed the Rubicon with regard to the decision about sending tanks, that eventually it'll get hundreds of tanks, a new tank army, and it'll have this spring offensive. Uh, Joe Biden says he will give Ukraine everything it, it needs to win. And Ukraine can decide how long the war will go on. At home, Biden is apparently comfortable with losing the House. He says his domestic program is already complete with the passage of the oddly named Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. It focuses almost a trillion dollars of green investment um, over the next 10 years on a series of projects. Biden sees himself in the tradition of the New Deal and the Great Society. Is this right? What is the legacy of FDR and the New Deal? So for answers to these things, I, I thought we would ask Eric Rauchway uh, in order to give us some guidance about how to think about the New Deal. Rauchway is the professor of history at UC Davis. He's the author of many studies on the Depression and the New Deal, including the uh, a very sharp, uh, lucid, short history in the Oxford series, The Great Depression, The New Deal, published in 2008. He's the author most recently of Why the New Deal Matters, published in 2021 by uh, Yale University Press. And he has an article on the subject in the forthcoming volume, Myth America, in which he takes on what he calls uh, a New Deal denialism. So welcome to Glasnost, Eric Rauchway. Hi, thanks for having me on. I thought we would um, um, kick things off by asking you to say something more about uh, New Deal denialism. When I was a student, uh, nobody uh, took criticism of the New Deal very seriously. Um, uh, there were a number of Roosevelt haters around, but no one took them, uh, took them, very, took them very seriously. Um, uh, and since then, though, uh, their arguments have amplified, and over the last uh, 30 or 40 years, uh, they've practically become kind of little orthodoxy. I, I don't know, maybe that's putting it too strongly. Uh, but their whole series of arguments have been ranged against uh, the New Deal. It didn't end the Depression. Um, it slowed a natural market recovery. Uh, it, did not, it didn't end unemployment. Uh, it was a kind of a tyranny, and even that it caused World War II. Um, American historians from Harry Elmer Barnes, Charles Callan Tanzel, economists such as um, uh, Mises and Hayek, uh, and nowadays uh, uh, the works of people like uh, Amity Schles, they've all continued these arguments and amplified them. Uh, but you think this is all wet, don't you? <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a kind way of putting it. I think that, uh, you know, there's an, there's an obvious incentive for uh, certain interests and certain classes of people to claim that the New Deal didn't work uh, and that interest is in preventing anything like from happening again. So broadly speaking, people who oppose government uh, investment in infrastructure, who oppose government regulation of industry or of the finance sector, uh, who oppose um, the removal of uh, the commanding heights from Wall Street to Washington, those kinds of folks uh, tend to want you to think that the New Deal was a terrible, terrible idea, and that therefore nothing resembling it should be our response to any economic crisis that even approaches resembling the Great Depression. So it's, a, it's an instrumentalist argument uh, that's largely made to oppose 
various kinds of economic stimulus that aren't tax cuts and, uh, you know, various kinds of investment in uh, public goods, as well as, uh, you know, pro-labor legislation and that sort of thing. So there's a sort of, as you say, a kind of uh, uh, an array of, 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 of disquisitions which will tell you that the New Deal was bad for the economy, that it prolonged the Depression, that it deepened the Depression, and that, uh, you know, it, 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 it prevented recovery. Um, <clears throat> I think if, as a historian, uh, I think there's sort of a couple problems with these kinds of arguments. I mean, first of all, as, as you say, they're, they're, they're wrong, right? I mean, that, that's, that's something the historian should avoid is things that are wrong. And um, it's simply not true that the uh, economy didn't grow, for example, during Roosevelt's first two terms in office, uh, that is to say during the New Deal and before mobilization for the war. Not only did the economy grow during that period, it grew really rapidly at like 9 and 10% a year, um, with the exception of the 1937-38 recession. So um, that's a first start, right? So you could say that even if you think the New Deal was a terrible, horrible, socialist, communist, pinko, whatever drag on the economy, it certainly wasn't enough of a drag on the economy to prevent a rapid economic recovery. I mean, that's sort of the minimum true thing that you can say uh, about the New Deal, and it's absent from that whole uh, universe of New Deal and the nihilism that you describe. And we know that Americans knew that uh, at the time. Uh, one of the obvious data points you could look at is the 1936 presidential election in which Roosevelt was reelected on a landslide that was bigger than anything since James Monroe ran essentially unopposed, right? So there's, a, you know, the, the American people, had they thought that his program was making the country worse, would have tossed him out on his ear. And instead, in fact, they resoundingly endorsed uh, the Roosevelt program. There are indeed political science studies which suggests that, in fact, where recovery was strongest, the swing towards Roosevelt was greatest, which really does suggest that people were quite sensitive to that issue. So we know that, you know, the economy recovered. We know that, uh, you know, um, uh, Americans at the time knew that. Now, there, there are nuances to this that we could get into. There's always nuances uh, that historians should acknowledge. I mean, if somebody says to you, the depression didn't end until the Second World War, as a flat statement of fact, that, that that's probably true, right? Uh, but it does omit to note that it was ending in a measurable and noticeable way, you know, during the- uh, uh, About that, uh, yeah. I've seen um, uh, graphs of, of uh, national income uh, for the period, and uh, they indicate, it strikes me, the way I interpret these graphs, uh, um, uh, there's practically a complete recovery by 1936. By 1936, uh, GMP uh, had reached, we would call it GDP today, but uh, national income had reached uh, pretty much the level it was in in 1923. So you have a V, a v curve uh, for that. Uh, there isn't this exploding growth beyond the 29 level, but you could argue, it seems to me, uh, that the economy had essentially recovered uh, by 1936. Would you would you go along with that idea? Well, I think you could say something. You could say something like that. I think w what you generally want to see, of course, is is not just uh, GDP returning to its pre-crash uh, yeah. level, but uh, keeping pace with the previous trend of growth. Right. So yeah. you don't see it returning to trend in real. Till the early 1940s. So that, that's why people will usually tell you, well, the depression is okay. not really over till then. And unemployment does remain higher than you'd like it to be um, through much of that period as well. So that, that again, that's why people would say that. But you're certainly right that there was a, re a strong recovery already visible by that point. So, and the, the unemployment, you put that at about what, 12%, something like that? Uh, you know, there are. Uh, there are various, various ways of counting uh, unemployment, it. <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and uh, there is a, there's a lot of obfuscation around this issue because for what are confessedly ideological reasons, the old standard theory, series of unemployment used to count people who worked for the WPA, the major yeah. uh, New Deal agencies, as if they were unemployed. And, you know, that, that that's kind of not playing fair. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's no, uh, there's no real reason that these folks who had jobs who kept these jobs for long periods of time, who treated these jobs as jobs who unionized and went on strike against, you know, who, in other words, acted like workers in all ways, uh, should be considered as unemployed. So, you know, the, 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 the numbers vary. So what, what figure do you end up with? In roughly, what, in, roughly, in, roughly in, ball, ballpark? 
I mean, for 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 what year? Uh, thirty-seven. I mean, thirty-seven. I well, thirty-seven. Roosevelt, is sort of the... re Roosevelt uh, recession. Thirty-seven. Well, right, right on the eve of the Roosevelt recession. Okay, let's let's yeah. How about that? I mean, so you're looking at you know you're looking at uh, you know something in the neighborhood of like nine percent or something like that at that point. Oh, very um, good. Yeah. yeah. So it's still quite high, but it's down from a high of you know twenty three, twenty four percent at the start of uh, Roosevelt's term, or twenty two percent, something like something like that. So, you know, again, it's not necessarily the level, it's the fact that people could see that it was uh, improving, that the direction uh, was the right thing that contributed to Roosevelt's reelection in 36, right? So uh, how did Roosevelt do it? Uh, there's, a, uh, there's an argument to the effect that uh, it was done simply by getting off the gold standard. Barry Eichengreen's book, you know, right. Golden Fetters. Um, and um, the way the argument of uh, Barry Eichengreen has been taken by others, and I'm among them, uh, um, the idea that um, uh, the whole trick was getting off the gold standard, because that meant you didn't have to uh, uh, instruct our central bank, the Fed, uh, uh, to do uh, in deflationary policy, the way the Europeans were, the way the British were. Now, the British and the French uh, uh, and the Americans, the key three economies. Uh, so getting off the gold standard was uh, the key to everything, even though the French didn't go off the gold standard until 1936. And, and and in a way that figures in the end of the the end of the New Deal. But on this question of gold, what, how do you uh, how do you see that as part of the Roosevelt program? Well, I think Roosevelt saw it as central, right? I mean, he he continued to use monetary tools throughout his entire administration and well into the war. Uh, he found them endlessly useful, and um, you know, it, 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 suspending. The gold standard going off the gold standard is certainly the, fir the first step. What Roosevelt really thought he was doing was um, beginning the era of adjusting currency to kind of uh, respond to cyclical trends. So using monetary policy actively, uh, the way some policymakers now will, will, will discuss doing um, to, to counteract um, you know, cyclical disturbances to the economy. So as you say, before that, at least in theory, the United States, like other gold standard na uh, nations, was obliged to adjust the amount of money in circulation according to the amount of gold it had on hand. After that, they could adjust the amount of money in circulation to what they thought the economy needed. So, um, you know, he, Roosevelt, not only went off the gold standard, he sort of transformed the dollar into a tool of economic stimulus. And then, of course, uh, also used it to, um, uh, you know, aid uh, countries like China or France who were um, in danger of being uh, uh, attacked or overrun by uh, fascist powers uh, when other tools were denied him. So he, as I say, he continued to find monetary policy to be um, a useful tool and, and 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 certainly going off the gold standard and pledging to use the dollar that way is a great stimulus for recovery i think everybody who's serious about this would, would, would acknowledge that um because you create the expectation of inflation or you reverse anyway the expectation of deflation right so down to that point and this is the first, almost the first thing that Roosevelt does on coming into office. Down to that point, from 1929 down to 1933, if you have money, right, you have a disincentive to spend it because you know that prices are going to fall and continue to fall. So anything you might want to buy is just going to be getting cheaper. So you might as well wait, right? So unless it's a, a need, you will hang on to your money, which is becoming more valuable by the day compared to all the things you'd like to buy. When Roosevelt comes into office and reverses that trend by saying, well, now money is going to become cheaper, in other words, the prices are going to go up, uh, that creates an incentive to buy. And so that jolts a lot of cash out of bank accounts, right, and into the economy. At least this is the sort of the, the sort of stylized story that a lot of macroeconomic historians will tell you about 1933. And it's visible, right, in the summer of 33 and into the fall of 34, the, uh, 33 and 34, this, you can see, uh, you know, people starting to spend money. And so it's this expectation of inflation that's usually credited for that. So equally, uh, of course, people will tell you that it's not enough to, to keep things going. And most notably at the times, uh, John Maynard Keynes was in the business of telling everybody that it was not enough to keep things going. So that's where you begin to get the debate over um, what we would now call fiscal stimulus. 
Okay, so uh, it's a, a cheap money and um, fiscal stimulus, cheap money and public works, I guess, uh, uh, the centerpieces of the, uh, of the New Deal. Uh, do you think, um, uh, Christina Romer, you know, she argues that uh, it's none of these things, but it's this influx of gold and it has to do, as I recall from the article I read of hers, um, that it's the influx of gold from Europe and it's because of the difficult uh, political situation. It begins with the Stavisky riots in France in 1934. That influx of gold uh, into the United States is what saved everything. And that um, it wasn't Roosevelt's policies, et cetera, one has led to, or one has left, I should put it that way, one is left to think. Um, it isn't Roosevelt's policy so much as this fortuitous influx of gold. Well, let's, let's uh, without Professor Romer here to defend this yeah. argument, let's, uh, <laughs> yeah. let's just sort of try it's, to, to treat it on a little unfair terms. here. Yeah, uh, I think that um, let's stipulate that this is correct, that it's the influx of gold from overseas that's critical. First of all, that owes to Roosevelt's policies, right? You are not going to get that influx of gold from overseas without Roosevelt's policies for stabilizing the bank for stabilizing the US dollar and for keeping it at a credible level of exchange, right? And specifically, you know, with, with reference to trade with Britain and France, Roosevelt's policy is focused first of all on those two countries. So even if you do accept it's the influx of gold, uh, you would still say, well, this is because of Roosevelt's policy. So that's, that's the first thing I would point out. Um, the second thing, uh, you know, the influx of gold is simply another way of talking about inflation. Right. There's a uh, that's more money coming into the U.S. economy. Uh, therefore, you would expect an increase of the money supply. The problem with this is, is that, you know, while it's certainly uh, it probably didn't have no effect and it was certainly visible to people at the time, Roosevelt's um, uh, Treasury sought to limit the influence of that money coming into the country by preventing it from increasing the money supply too rapidly, right? You also don't see a massive increase of bank lending during this period. So if you're expecting that this influx of uh, money is going to be the thing that spurs the economy into action, that's not, not, the, not the channel that you're seeing it come through. Um, I, think, I think that the, you know, it's, it's, it's broadly correct and useful to note that the, um, improvement of the US economy is not entirely separable from the Roosevelt administration's attitude towards the advance of Nazism in Europe and towards Europeans' uh, uh, attitudes towards that as well. But I, I don't think you contribute it solely to the influx of, of money. Um, I mean, so anyone, the, sorry, go ahead. The people who, the three million or so people at a pop at a time who worked for the WPA n knew who they were working for, uh, you know, and it wasn't uh, uh, jobs created by that influx of money. So uh, when I was a grad student, uh, I uh, studied with uh, somebody who had the uh, idea that, uh, and actually wrote on it, uh, Albert, and I think he shows up in your footnotes uh, somewhere, Albert Ramosco. Uh, had the idea that um, the Hoover administration was a big plus, uh, how to put it, um, that uh, the Hoover administration uh, in its small way, to be sure, small, um, uh, kicked off uh, a number of these uh, Roosevelt uh, ideas and programs. And of course, um, later on, um, I found out more about uh, Jesse Jones and the uh, Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which uh, got its origins from, uh, from Hoover. Um, so, I mean, to what degree do you think that figures in our uh, understanding of, uh, of the New Deal? That is, that is to say, that's a kind of a substitute for fiscal policy, setting up this corporation. Felix Rowatton um, suggested something like that about, I guess it was 20 years ago. He said there ought to be some kind of a big private corporation, he said, and uh, it ought to be able to sell bonds and it ought to be able to uh, lend for infrastructure uh, investment, and you know, like uh, Jesse Jones and the R RFC, it strikes me. Um, so what do you think of this notion that Hoover kicked off some of these Roosevelt programs? Well, it would certainly be true to say that uh, the RFC, first of all, it's obviously true to say that the RFC originated during the Hoover administration, and that during the Roosevelt administration, it became an important source of funds for public works investment. 
uh, I would say that that doesn't mean that Hoover had anything to do with it. In fact, Hoover himself vigorously opposed it. Um, it was essentially something that he signed off on after resisting for a long time, after forcing an alternative, the National Credit Corporation, uh, into existence. And only after that failed did Hoover reluctantly agree to sign the RFC uh, law. And then, of course, during the Hoover administration, it wasn't used in the way that it would be used in the Roosevelt administration. It was only the New Deal and the Public Works Administration, and the National Industrial Recovery Act that allowed RFC funds to be used to those kinds of creative purposes. During the Hoover administration, it was used almost exclusively for bailing out banks and then to a very limited extent because, again, Hoover opposed its use. Right. So, um, there's a whole separate field of Hoover was not such a terrible fellow studies, which I find actually <laughs> much more difficult to understand than the New Deal denialist studies. If we're being utterly honest, I can understand why somebody would say the New Deal didn't work because there's an obvious interest there. To say that Herbert Hoover was actually a swell fellow who kind of did a proto New Deal is okay, almost okay. completely inexplicable to me because if you look at Hoover's own utterances, you know that he would sooner shoot himself than be associated with the New Deal or anything like it. He thought of it as Bolshevism. Sure. He thought of it as regimentation. He accused it at various times of being fascism or communism. And he certainly said it would crack the timbers of the Constitution and ruin the Republic as we know it. So the idea that Herbert Hoover is somehow a proto New Dealer would cause the man himself to spin in his grave. Again, I <laughs> find the whole thing just inexplicable right. um, except of course for my uh, 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 graduate alma mater which has an institutional investment in saying Herbert Hoover was a swell fellow because yes. he's Stanford University's only president the, today the so. Hoover, the Hoover yeah. erection so to speak yeah you um, have to put uh, you have to put something there yeah okay um, I suppose we subtract Herbert Hoover from this thing and uh, put the argument slightly differently. The RFC, uh, uh, here's the proposition. The RFC was the real key uh, to the New Deal. It was the key to public works and not def uh, deficit spending. Uh, would that be correct? I mean, again, it's not the RFC of 1932. It's the RFC of 1933 and yes. afterwards, after New Deal legislation has said we're taking some of the RFC money and we're giving it to, to um, uh, Harold Dickies for the PWA. You know, we're taking some of the RFC money and we're giving it to Harry Hopkins. You know, that- that And, that, the, and the Bay Bridge and the- Right, exactly. The so, I mean, and, um, yeah. to say it's not the New Deal, it's the RFC is to just sort of wish away the fact that without the New Deal, there would be no RFC like that. That is the, that is the New Deal then, the RFC. Yeah. Yeah. Those who, um, excuse me, uh, then the lesson would be uh, those who espouse a return to the traditions of the New Deal ought to espouse an infrastructure bank uh, that could uh, uh, direct public works. Yeah, there's there's lots of um, I mean, you know, there, there are a variety of different ways the New Deal went around financing public works. And as you say, one of them is basically an infrastructure bank. So you get like the, the PWA, the Public Works Administration, which is run through the Department of Interior, is basically like that, right? They they sort of split the costs of um, infrastructure in terms of uh, public private or uh, federal state, um, you know, grants that they go about sort of seeking and financing these projects. And then they have rigid rules for the kinds of contractors who can work for them in the ways that labor can be employed. And so there are, you know, they, they contribute to labor rights uh, by, by that process, but it's basically done in partnership you know, with private enterprise and with the states or localities. And that's one of the models. And as you, you, you mentioned, it's one of the big models. This is one of the models for like the big public works, like the Bay Bridge or like the Shasta Dam. The, the, those usually come out of the PWA. And that's that's great for the kind of public works investment, uh, you know, that let's say California now needs, you know, uh, as we are talking, we're just ending up uh, some 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 period of horrific rains and floodings. And there are all of a sudden a lot of articles in California newspapers about uh, what should we do for our infrastructure to make it easier to capture this kind of stormwater so that we don't have a period of drought punctuated by these storms that then immediately segues into another period of drought. And for that kind of investment, an infrastructure bank would be great, right? Because we need these major projects um, we recognize that they should be well planned and it'll take, take a while to get them in place, but then once we've got them, we can expect them to last for generations. That's not an urgent response to an economic crisis. 
right? So that, that, that's a different kind of public work spending. Now, the Roosevelt administration also took, undertook another kind, which was direct employment. Uh, you know, whether it was with the Civil Works Administration in the first year and a bit of the New Deal, or then afterwards the successor agency, the Works Progress Administration, you know, the federal government in those cases directly employed people to do things that didn't require a lot of planning or investment and could be done quickly. So there's sort of, broadly speaking, two categories of public works. And the infrastructure bank style with the RFC or the PWA is the one that leads to the longer term improvements, like the ones that we still use. Um, the direct employment style is more for let's get out of the crisis. Let's show people that the federal government works for the ordinary American and thus help to restore people's faith in the government. So they serve different purposes. Hmm. Very we still have a lot of WPA projects with us, as I'm sure as I'm sure you'll know. Huh. Uh, you know, they just tend to be a little bit humbler than those things like the the Bay Bridge or the Shasta Dam. Yeah. Um, so, it, it, would you call all this Keynesianism, or what's the relation to the uh, the notions of Keynes nowadays? Uh, when one uh, hears it to say, in the discourse, you say New FDR, New Deal, Keynes. Uh, sure. Um, was FDR a Keynesian, strictly speaking? Uh, I, I don't think Keynes would have thought so. <laughs> I don't think, yeah. uh, uh, although Keynes tried to make him into one. You know, I mean, Keynes's own critique and the Keynesian critique of the New Deal is that it wasn't big enough, that Roosevelt was doing the right things, just not enough of them, so that the WPA was great. It should have been, you know, an order of magnitude bigger that there should have been many more people, it should have been much more consistent, it should have lasted continuously over a period of years, and you would have seen recovery. So on the, on the arithmetic of Keynesianism, and again, Keynes pointed this out at the time, the New Deal was never adequate to the purpose, right? There was never enough deficit spending to produce full employment in the way that you did get when you began to have mobilization for World War II. So that's another reason that people will point to the to the war as key is you simply have you know Harry Hopkins goes from being the head of the WPA to being the head of lend lease in both capacities he's employing Americans but he has a budget that's 10 times greater when he's the head of lend lease because it's politically easier to appropriate money for building armaments in time of crisis than it is to appropriate money to build schools and sidewalks and merely useful and pacific things that we all like right mm -hmm. uh and that's a that's a, that's a tragedy of american politics but it, it seems to be the case so uh we should have had an earlier bigger new deal is the keynesian argument about the new deal it's not that it's the wrong kind of thing it's just that there's not enough of it well there's some other things though keynes uh, uh, argued that uh, uh, mercantilism had basically been un misunderstood and uh uh, he wrote, as you know, he wrote this essay for Yale Review in uh, 1933, in which there appears the phrase, um, let goods be homespun, uh, let finance be national. Gee, that's really a, an enormous departure. And uh, I, did Roosevelt actually go that route? No. No, I mean, in Keynes's flirtation with uh, nationalism, economic nationalist was actually fairly brief as well. I mean, it's... Um, it was certain, you know, Roosevelt began his presidency at a kind of high point of economic nationalism because you'd had a dozen years of Republican presidents. The tariff was their favorite policy. Plus, you also had immigration restriction. So, you know, you had this sort of long uh, period of nationalism, and there were certainly people arguing what you're talking about there for economic. I mean, mostly William Randolph Hearst, for example, was a big proponent of that kind of thing. Uh, in 33, the whole buy American, see American first, employ only Americans, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, Roosevelt was a Democrat from a family of Democrats. They were long believers in free or at least freer trade. And Roosevelt was an internationalist. You know, he'd served in the administration of Woodrow Wilson. He'd sort of trimmed a bit uh, to get Hearst's endorsement and to get elected, but essentially he remained an internationalist. So almost one of the first things he did, even before taking office, but after being elected, was to meet with one of Hearst's guys and say, you, you got to 
cool it on the whole nationalism thing. We're not going that route, right? That, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Roosevelt chose for his Secretary of State Cordell Hull, who was a great exponent of lowering tariffs. And indeed, as soon as possible, right, they got a tariff lowering act in place. Roosevelt's monetary policy was always internationalist in nature. He tried to negotiate a, uh, a coordinated going off the gold standard in 33 when that failed. You know, he eventually got that in 36, you know, when, as you say, France finally went off the gold standard and of course, ultimately ended up with Keynes's, uh, you know, considerable input with the Bretton Woods system, which is a non-gold standard international um, framework. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Roosevelt's whole presidency was about preserving international ties. And that really became much more emphatic, of course, with the effort to oppose Nazism. So. Mm. Well, um, Keynes, uh, let's see, what is that? interesting questions pop up. I have to choose among them. Um, let's see, Cordell Hall, he's from Tennessee, was he not? It's a tobacco state. Uh, um, the South is free trade minded. Let's see. Right. Uh, the South, uh, could this thing have been done without the South? And as you point out in your recent work, uh, we're talking about the Jim Crow South. Could any of this have been accomplished uh, without the solid South? Well, I mean, no, not, 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 in, the, um, not in the way it was anyway. I mean, Roosevelt's, um, Roosevelt's nomination depended on the South because one of his principal opponents for the Democratic nomination was Al Smith, who was the darling of Northeastern progressives. And so Roosevelt's initial strategy for going for the nomination was to lock up the South and people like Hull and other Southerners first. So within the Democratic Party, Roosevelt depended on Southerners. And then of course, especially for the early years of the New Deal, um, Southern votes, Southern senators particularly, were central to Roosevelt's administration. Right. Um, you don't have a Democratic majority nationally without Southern votes, and that means without white Southern votes, which means without the disfranchisement of black voters in the South um, in, in 1930, in the 1930s. Um, so, so, so no, uh, you know, Roosevelt depended on those votes at the same time, of course, as it's Roosevelt's policies that bring black voters into the Democratic Party. Yeah, right? this is the most genuinely interesting what, story, I think, especially blacks, in our own time. The Blacks come over to the Democratic Party pretty much on a promissory note, do they not? Well, no, I don't. I, I mean, some of them do. Not, not I think, real but, payment, but the real, real, the real payment, switch but a promissory in, note. The real switch comes in 36 when they've seen what the New Deal will do for them, right? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's when there's been a demonstration that, in fact, programs like the WPA won't discriminate. A demonstration them. which creates expectations. Right, right, sure. Expectations of more. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's that, that's absolutely correct. I mean, you know, the, the Democratic Party, when Roosevelt becomes president in 33, is split between its northern wing, which is generally more cosmopolitan. There are more ethnic voters. There are already some black voters and its southern wing, which is, uh, as you say, the Jim Crow wing. Roosevelt himself is from the northern wing. Roosevelt himself also makes overtures towards the southern wing. He sets up his house in Georgia so that he can say, I am also a southerner as well mm -hmm. as from New York State, right? <laughs> he he knows the nature of the political, you know, tightrope that he's walking during these years. And, you know, it, it's a product of circumstance and Roosevelt's skill that he's able to keep together a coalition where he is simultaneously advancing black voting rights while also holding on to the white South. Um, it's probably not something that could have happened in any other period. And it's quite likely it's not something that could have been carried off by a politician who was less adept than Roosevelt. But he's able to do that for the entirety of his years in, in office. You know it falls apart immediately upon almost his death in 1948 when Truman runs to be his successor, right? That's when you get Strom Thurmond and the Dixiecrats leaving the party. And the party runs scared from civil rights for, you know, another for a dozen years. Adlai Stevenson, who runs in 52 and 56, runs away from civil rights. It's not until Kennedy in 60 that you begin to have the National Party tiptoeing back towards being a party of civil rights. Really. And uh, toward uh, a future of losing a lot of elections. 
Well, it, well, I mean, you know, <laughs> what do you, uh, Lyndon Johnson's remark on the passage of the Civil Rights Act is that we have lost the South for a generation or something like that. That seems yeah. to be correct. But I mean, during the Roosevelt administration, you know, he, Roosevelt is able to keep the White South on board, you know, while simultaneously inventing the civil rights division in the in the in the Department of Justice. It's the civil rights section. It becomes a division under Eisenhower. But, you know, he's got this unit that brings cases for civil rights during his presidency and most notably uh, wins a Supreme Court case to establish that primaries are subject to uh, federal oversight, which paves the way for eliminating the all white primary in the South. So, hmm. Well, um, suppose we return for a second to this Keynesian theme. You know, there are a lot of Keynes's. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's the Keynes who criticized the Versailles Treaty. And uh, you might say that's the Keynes that, um, in fact, I think you do say, um, I can't remember now, you'll have to uh, tell us, uh, uh, um, that uh, that's the Keynes that um, everybody took much more seriously by 1945. Um, and there's the Keynes we've been talking about. There's um, uh, Easy money, public works, let goods be homespun of the early 30s. Um, uh, how about this idea of the, of the state as a, um, as a yardstick, uh, uh, this theory of the state's intervention in the economy? Um, you could say maybe that's a lasting imprint of uh, Keynes's thought on FDR. That makes sense? I, I'm not sure that that comes from Keynes, but there's certainly some kinship there. I mean, I think that you're also, you know, you, you, you might throw into your various Keynes's, the Keynes of International Monetary Forum, which is, in yeah. fact, his earlier project going back to the earliest years of the 20th century, and of course, culminates in the, in the Bretton Woods project. In so, Bancor. Yeah. yeah, and that's, that's uh, you know, an idea that Roosevelt is on board with as early as 33. He wants there to be a non-gold international unit modeled on the, on the dinar in his, his idea, right? An international uh, a currency to replace the dollar? Well, I mean, it, 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 it's, uh, at that time, the dollar wasn't the international currency, right? It was an, an international currency to replace gold. Well, um, well um, I think even in the 30s, you could say the dollar is uh, beginning to uh, have sort of pretensions. The main thing is the French going off gold. Right. The, the, the US and, and the French are the, uh, the uh, main winners in this competition for gold that's going on through the 20s and 30s. And then right. it's not the French anymore. It's just the US after 1936. So that's capital flight, uh, fleeing from the uh, popular front and uh, the big strikes, the Matignon agreement of 1936. And then- um, And uh, also from the Nazis, I mean. Not exactly. I don't think so. The uh, French- uh, I don't think the, the, the French uh, were not uh, worried about, I think, a, a, a German attack in 36 any more than at any other time. Okay. Um, I think it's a, a question of that capital flight. And, uh, uh, and when they went off gold, um, and they're going to lose all this gold to the United States, uh, the question arises, uh, what's the United States going to do now? Is it going to sit on, on top of the heap? and dictate to the world. And the United States reassured them with that ag agreement. Roosevelt reassured them at the end of 36 with the uh, tripartite agreement uh, that uh, from this point on, the United States would not try to take advantage of the embarrassment of the, of the French and of course the British would not try to uh, take it. And, and then um, there comes this uh, conservative turn, uh, balanced budgets and all the rest of that. And then the Roosevelt recession. Um, do you think there's an international way of seeing the causes of the Roosevelt recession in 37? Yeah, well, I mean, I think one of the things that, um, if you ask Doug Irwin, who's an economist, uh, you know, he'll tell you that it's, uh, it's because of the, um, the efforts to tame those gold inflows, right? That the um, Morgenthau Treasury undertakes a gold sterilization policy which is to say a way of preventing uh, that gold from entering the U.S. domestic monetary supply. And, 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 and Irwin will tell you that's, that's why you have the downturn of 37. The problem is, of course, it comes um, at the same time, as you say, is there's also, uh, also supported by Morgenthau, a move towards uh, lowering the, um, 
the the uh, uh, the deficit, right? Which really begins actually in thirty six, and then with the budget that they do in thirty seven is is even more pronounced. They cut back on public works, so you know there's a reduction of both monetary stimulus and fiscal stimulus at the same time. That spoils your scientific experiment as to which one is the one that causes it. But in you know. Uh, both of those things uh, uh, are usually taken to have contributed in one way or another um, to the downturn in 37. And you say that's the end of the New Deal. I, I, I don't think that's right. Um, if I did say that, I, I, I must have misspoken. I think that uh, I think that there's a the New Deal is definitely dealt a severe setback. Um, you still see some more New Deal measures uh, in 38, uh, you know, the Fair Labor Standards Act, which does away with child labor, institutes the national minimum wage. You also see New Dealers within the administration sort of putting together packages for more New Deal um, in the 37 and 38. I think it's the, you know, it's the, it's the Munich Agreement that really creates your, uh, your, your problem at the end of the year. And that you know, occasions the real turn towards military mobilization, which still isn't the end of the New Deal, but it's the end of the New Deal sort of as was. I think it's, it's you know, the New Deal becomes subsumed into Roosevelt's war rhetoric. I mean, the way Ro Roosevelt states but war isn't, aims- But isn't the all... New Deal based- What's that? Isn't the New Deal based on a rationale that uh, is essentially, Roosevelt himself referred uh, to the state action of World War One, and, uh, and right, they're not easily the necessities separate. of foreign policy and war and all the rest of that right. as uh, essentially the underpinning uh, for this uh, effort in the defense of the national interest. I'm not talking about an economic nationalism in the most crude crude sense, but uh, a kind of permanent war economy, military Keynesianism. Sometimes people call it. Well, except they didn't build weapons right they didn't build the oh, they were building aircraft carriers uh, right from the beginning not, not not right from the beginning though i mean <laughs> a bit uh, later under, yeah. under uh, wpa the wpa was initially barred from doing defense work right it's it's, it's only a bit later that they're allowed to, to, to do that kind of thing I, I mean i think that you know picking these things apart are um it's impossible right um, actually we're trying to put them together we're trying well, to yeah, say, that's what I'm saying. I think that, we're trying to say that the, um, uh, the there is a sort of a nationalist imperative in the idea of the New Deal, and that um, there, it isn't such a dramatic shift when Roosevelt says, uh, "Don't call me Mr. New Deal anymore. Call me Mr. Doctor Win the War." That's another quotation that gets a little bit too much exercise, in my view. I think. Oh, good. Uh, tell tell us why. Well, because Roosevelt wouldn't have even run for a third term were it not for the war, and his decision to run for a third term is based in large measure on his desire to uh, ensure that the New Deal is defended into the war years in the way that he felt that progressivism was not defended into the years of World War I. And the way Roosevelt describes the war, even before the United States is in it, is very much as a New Deal type war. When you look at the Four Freedoms, uh, freedom from want is a fundamental underpinning of international security. And that security is described in terms of economic security, which goes back to social security, you yeah. know, which it's all of a piece. And, and again, Keynes recognizes this. Keynes argues for uh, the American support of international aid based on social security. And the idea of a positive vision that the US should support the allies against the Nazis based on a war that's going to make the world look more like the New Deal of the United States, right? And so when you get things like the GI Bill during the war, it shouldn't be surprising that they closely resemble the kinds of guarantees that the New Deal wanted to put forward for everyone, right? So I, th I think it's very easy to say that, uh, you know, if you look at Lend-Lease, if you look at the um, uh, the second bill, economic bill of rights. If you look at the GI Bill of Rights, these all look like New Deal measures for a reason, and that it's the reason is that Roosevelt is still a New Deal president even during the war. Mm -hmm. This is a nice. This is very nicely put. Um, I guess uh, you would say that uh, perhaps we're wrong if we think of the New Deal as just a series of economic uh, uh, devices. Uh, 
and that it's uh, oh, yeah. it's, it's really a broader, to a broader defense of the the, the idea of democ uh, democracy. I think that goes back to the very first question you asked me, where I said there are two reasons I oppose New Deal denialism, and I never got around to the second one. The second, but here's a good time to bring it up. The second one is that I think the argument over whether the New Deal contributed to economic recovery is missing the point, right? That Roosevelt's understanding of the New Deal was to ex preserve and extend democracy right? in a world where it was under threat. You know, I know that you know this, I know that probably most people listening to this know this, but it bears repeating that between Roosevelt's election and inauguration, Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany, right? And by the time the New Deal's first 100 days were underway, Roosevelt, I mean, uh, Hitler had become Fuhrer, right? Uh, with essentially, you know, plenary power, right? Roosevelt was alert to the threat that that posed to democracy around the world, not just within Germany, much sooner than most other people. And there are a variety of reasons for this, but, you know, we, it, it's certainly true. And, uh, you know, from the very beginning, he thought that people who would hearken to a Nazi style message in the United States needed to be neutralized and that the New Deal was a mechanism for doing that. Right? That you would show people who might otherwise join fascist groups that they should support the American government as was because it would work for them. Um, this is vividly illustrated in terms of the bonus march probably know this story. There was a group of uh, unemployed veterans in 1932 who were led by a man named Walt Waters from Oregon all the way to Washington, right, accumulating strength on the way. By the time they were in Washington, D.C., there were maybe 15 to 20,000 of them. They stayed there. They demonstrated in favor of a, of a bonus payment to relieve their unemployment for a long time. Congress said no. Hoover said no. Uh, they wouldn't leave. Hoover ultimately ran them off with the army under Douglas MacArthur. And um, Roosevelt saw that as a critical event, one that could lead to fascism through either of two routes, either the kinds of people who supported the using the army to run off the unemployed would continue to support increases of militarization to keep the left at bay, as they saw it, or people like Waters would continue to rile up uh, unemployed veterans and create the sort of basis of an American brown shirt movement. And Roosevelt specifically saw the New Deal as a way to kind of neutralize those threats. And it's worth pointing out that it worked, right? One of the first things Roosevelt did was to create the Civilian Conservation Corps, which would take young men out of cities where they might be dangerous and put them in the wilderness where they could then be productive and also not be part of mobs in cities and hive off part of the CCC's jobs, specifically for veterans of the first war. And it was that action that persuaded Walter Waters, who was the leader of the Bonus Army, that they didn't need to do any more Bonus Armying, right? Because there were now going to be jobs set aside for veterans, right? That's what Roosevelt saw the New Deal as doing, was showing people who would otherwise become fascists, they didn't have to do that, that they could have faith in the American government as it existed, that it was going to serve ordinary Americans. And that's what the New Deal strived to do. And so if you measure it on, does it make the line go in the right direction? You're grossly missing the point, right? It is from the beginning, a movement to prevent fascism, first in the United States, and then to keep it at bay around the world. I guess so. <laughs> you, you, beautifully put, beautifully put. Right. Well, this is absolutely fascinating stuff. And I, I myself, from my taste, I could go on for hours uh, with this. Uh, of course, I'm sure you would, couldn't, but uh, I, I could do it. I could listen to you for hours. And um, But we have to break this off. We have to conclude. So thanks very much to um, Eric Rochway for an illuminating, fascinating uh, discussion of, of the New Deal. And, um, and goodbye. Uh, goodbye to Glasnost. Um, viewers, until next time, uh, when we will continue to ask the question, uh, we've tried everything else, why not try thinking about it? <laughs>